by Pastor Drew. We haven't had a longer ending in some time, uh, but here we are kicking off a new series about stewardship. Yeah. And um, kind of introductory, well, first sermon was on stewardship of self. God has given you gifts and abilities. Mm -hmm. How do you steward who you are and what you have to the best of your abilities? How, uh, if you had more time, what would we have drilled down into about how to steward who we are for God? That's a good way to put it. Um, Yeah, so um, I focused a lot um, in the sermon on uh, the fact that God has given us gifts um, that he intends for us to use for the advancement of his kingdom and in his service and in service of others. And um, in, in retrospect, as I think about how I preached that sermon, it was, it was geared more toward those in our congregation that perhaps um, second guess whether or not they have valuable gifts with mm-hmm. regard to kingdom service. And so it was, it was a sermon intended to convince people, hey, God has given you very significant gifts. And, you know, when you think about the things that you are gifted in and interested in and passionate about, um, you know, those, I would, I would argue that those are spiritual gifts that, that God can use in magnificent ways for the advancement of his kingdom. Um, if I had had more time, I maybe would have focused more on, you know, where does God's generosity in giving us gifts and our responsibility to use those gifts, um, where does God's, re- God's generosity end and our responsibility to use them sure. begin, right? So it all starts with God, but, you know, even in, uh, even in talking this through, at some point, we need to realize that we have these gifts and we need to to plug into places where we can use them. Hmm. Interesting. So what if, what if I'm the person, um, started by saying this, this first sermon is particularly helpful for someone whose gifts maybe aren't, it's not immediately evident how their gifts are used for the kingdom of God. Yeah. Uh, you and I, it happens to be pretty immediately evident. Right. We preach at a church mm-hmm. and other pastoral duties. But uh, but great way into the story is Moses' staff. It's the tool of the shepherd. You take that gift that God has given you, you use it. So if, if I have a gift that's it's, it's not as immediately evident, tool of my trade, uh, what are some things you would suggest to that person to either hone that skill for use of the kingdom or to make sure that they're being diligent and using it? Like what's some advice to not just have the tool, but make sure we're utilizing it best? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I think it has, it, it, it has to do first with an awareness of ourselves, but then secondly, and this is where the rubber meets the road, It has to do with um, our self-discipline. And, uh, you know, once we know, then we need to be intentional. We need to discipline ourselves to uh, put those gifts to work in advancement of the kingdom. And I'll I'll give you an example just from today. Um, Tonight, we're having another community meal. And we have this handful of extremely, extremely talented women who know how to organize something like this, who know how to um, to kind of manage both having a, a sit-in meal and also run a drive-through. Yeah. We have women who, you know, know how to, how to make the food and how to arrange the food and how to present the food. And if you would ask them, hey, you know, would, would you consider this a spiritual gift? They'd say, no, this is just, you know, this is just something that I know how to do and I just love to serve. And I would say, well, then correction, that is a spiritual gift. Right. And they have disciplined themselves. They have made the choice to kind of make a commitment and then honor a commitment. And, 
you know, the kingdom is advanced. And so that's just a, that's what we need to do with, with all of our gifts and talents is just be mindful of where to plug them in and where to use them. And, you know, most of us are going to have a lower estimation of our gifts than maybe we should. But as long as we're using them, God can do amazing things with those gifts. Right. So part of it is physical discipline, working on your thing. Uh, you mentioned, you know, this, this meal prep kind of thing. Say it's carpentry. Um, getting better at carpentry would mm -hmm. be a discipline and making sure that you're using that gift of carpentry for the kingdom of God to serve others. Physical discipline. Does spiritual discipline benefit your gifts and how so? Well, spiritual disciplines, are you talking about the spiritual disciplines? Right. Prayer, fasting, devotions, fasting. devotional reading. I would say that those are always going to um, enhance your holistic life, hmm. um, your spiritual life and your holistic life, because really... What you're doing with all of the spiritual disciplines is you're creating space to listen to God. You know, you're, you're creating space where God can um, have an opportunity to, to lead you in a new direction or affirm the direction that you've already taken. But, you know, in talking about self-discipline, I was, I was more, and this is a bit of a criticism of my own generation and maybe some younger than my generation, um, it, it seems like, it seems like my generation is a very non-committal generation. And so, you know, people, peers of mine don't like to make commitments. They don't like to agree to serve on a board or to, um, become part of a Bible study that me meets regularly because they want to kind of hold it in reserve that if something better comes up, yeah. you know. I want to just be making decisions as we go. And so in that way, they avoid making commitments altogether. And one, they miss out on those opportunities to use their spiritual gifts because they haven't committed to being a part of something where, the, you know, where they can be used. And another thing is they're not going to develop those gifts either. They're not going to be effective because, you know, Really, being non-committal is a, a way of just chasing pleasure in this world, and so that's not not a path that that God would say is is healthy or helpful for us either. Yeah. yeah. Another thing, I answering my own question about how spiritual disciplines might help us with our you know manifested gifts, cooking, carpentry, etc. Um, there's a little booklet called I think it's called Practicing the Presence of God. Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence. And I, I had a copy and I've given it away. Um, but it's a, it's a fairly small booklet, if I'm remembering correctly. It's been a while. Uh, and Brother Lawrence just kind of shares how he does daily life. Um, washing dishes and weeding the garden. Mm -hmm. Intentionally focused on how washing the dishes and weeding the garden is an act of service to God. Yeah. And it, like the simplest, the simplest things that everybody can do. And when you talk about it not being immediately evident that your gifts are used for the kingdom, but Brother Lawrence is saying, every breath I take. Yeah. And just being, being mindful about your impact and your service to the Lord in every stage, practicing being in the presence of God when you're emptying the dishwasher or sweeping the floor, right? So... Uh, that is something that spiritual disciplines heightens for us. Yeah. The more we pray, the more we do devotions, the more we uh, fast and um, practice the presence of God, yeah. the, the easier it is for us to recognize the impact we have it's with funny. even our most basic gifts. Yeah, Brother Lawrence's um, testimony and example has influenced how many millions of people in the last few hundred years. Yeah. And uh, he was he was of about the lowest status in the monastery or yeah. the monastic community right. he was part of that you could be. Yeah. And yet his influence far outweighed any position or any, you know, flashiness in his 
role within his community, you know? So, yeah, yeah that's case in point. Very we, good. We read books like Radical <coughs> and read one now with a Bible study called Extraordinary and mm-hmm. Do Hard Things is another one that was popular. And there's all these, you know, pop Christian books that talk about the most amazing, significant, th- sell all you own and travel mm-hmm. to Burma, Myanmar, and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, give your life for the gospel. And uh, of course, right, that's wonderful. Sure. But Brother Lawrence's testimony is as radical. Yeah. Even though it's it it it's so attainable for everybody, it's well, yeah. It's kind of like, hey, do you take a shower every day? Pretty much every day. How can how can how can how can I be glorifying God when I'm taking a shower? Hmm. It, it's asking yourself those questions, yeah. right? And you ask yourself enough of those questions, and you ask yourself those questions regularly, and all of a sudden you have put together a life that is you know, glorifying to God 24-7, yeah. you know, it's yeah. possible. And that's where, like when Paul says, like, pray without ceasing, I don't know if it's Paul, New Testament, and like my immediate reaction to that is like, not possible. Right. Because I have to do things in my life. I can't just sit and pray. Mm-hmm. But that kind of attitude that Brother Lawrence has, and I think I think is what Paul's getting at, is yeah. just like, everything I do is prayer, because everything I do is, in communion with God. Yeah. And that that doesn't take traveling across the world to serve to do. Yeah. And being mindful, yeah, being mindful that Christ is present with you wherever you go, whatever you're doing. And so at any moment you might look crazy to your friends, but you can turn to Jesus and talk to him. You know, you don't have to be talking all the time. You don't have to be constantly talking. That's not what pray without ceasing means. Right. But just to be aware that you are always, always in the presence of God is, uh, you know, in, in a sense, I think that that's pray without ceasing. Mm-hmm.